Part One. You will hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical center of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Hello. Sit down, please. Thank you. Now, you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right. We'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student. Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And、um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty-six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well, frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine. It can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And then... I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? 
Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well? Yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counselling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counselling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear someone talking about a wildlife park. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone. I'm a keeper here at Arana Wildlife Park and that means that my job is to look after some of the animals that we have here. First, let me tell you a bit about us. Um, the word Arana means welcome in the local Māori language and we are very pleased to see you all here. <laughs> As you probably know, we are run by a charity and we specialise in endangered species of animals, birds and reptiles. The park grounds cover 80 hectares of land and we have 400 animals altogether from 70 different species. So that you can see the animals in their natural environment, we've built streams and banks to separate you from the animals and make sure your trip around the park is safe. <laughs> Our animals come mainly from here, New Zealand, and from Australia, Africa and South America. There are a lot of animals to see and quite a number of things you can do here, so let me tell you about a few of the exciting encounters before you decide where to go. <clears throat> One of our most popular animals is a type of giraffe called a Rothschild. It's easy to spot. It has three horns rather than the usual two. Oh. Giraffes are amazing animals close up and you have an opportunity to hand feed them here at the park at 12 noon or 3 in the afternoon. This is one of the most popular activities and will be one that you'll never forget. In fact, we believe hands-on education is very important so you can touch or pat a variety of friendly animals such as cows and goats at the farmyard. This experience goes on all day and is designed to help children take an interest in animals and their environment. I can assure you it's not at all dangerous. <laughs> Another exciting activity for visitors is watching some of our big cats reach speeds of up to 70 kilometres per hour during their exercise run. The cheetah is the fastest land mammal and this event takes place at 3.40 every day. You can watch them go down their paddock in under 30 seconds. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
So, here's a plan of the park. As you can see, we're here at the main entrance, and there's an information centre to your right. Now, it's quite easy to get around the park. We have daily guided walkabout tours, which let you get up close to the animals. Or, if you prefer to be at a distance, you can take the safari bus and drive around with a wildlife expert. If you decide to take the walkabout tour, it leaves at 10.45, that's in just under an hour, from the meerkats enclosure next to us. From there, the walk passes the adventure playground and the otters in the first enclosure, and then arrives at the New Zealand birds area in the next enclosure, just in time to see them being fed. Then you go on to the reptile house and the tigers and the rest of the animals. Alternatively, you can wait until the afternoon walk. There are plenty of other things to see in the morning. One of these is the African village. Just turn to your right from the main entrance, walk past the first bus stop, and it's just before the African wild dogs enclosure. It's a wonderful, colourful experience. You can also go to the shop and buy your souvenirs there. We have beautiful soft toys, giraffe and zebra, for children, and a whole range of t-shirts, hats and skincare products with an African theme. After that, why not have lunch in the picnic area on the far eastern side of the park? I'd recommend this because while you're eating, you might catch sight of the ostriches on one side of you or buffalo on the other. For the afternoon walkabout tour, you'll need to find your own way to the African lion habitat, which is on the west side of the park, just past the conservation centre. To join the tour, you actually go past the lion habitat. You'll see two bus stops, keep walking, and the meeting place is about half a kilometre after the second one. If you've gone past the zebra, you've gone too far. For those of you who would prefer to travel on the safari bus, this runs from 10.30 to 4pm. There are stations throughout the park, but the first one is at Jomo's Cafe, which is directly opposite where we're standing. Go straight ahead, and it's just in front of the giraffes. There are various feeding times for the animals, and the bus stops in time for all of these. So, let me just give you some safety guidelines. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. The black bear, or Ursus americanus, has a wide range inhabiting forested areas of North America, including Canada, the United States, and parts of northern Mexico. Black bears are omnivores, getting their nutrition from a wide variety of plants and animals. The particular foods any one bear eats depends on what's available in the area where that bear lives, as well as on the season of the year. Generally speaking, plant foods make up 90% of the bear's diet. The rest of its meals consist of animal foods, such as insects and fish. Bears have a relatively long gestation period. Mating takes place in the spring or early summer, but bear cubs aren't born until the following winter. 
Usually, two cubs are born at a time, although some litters may have as many as five cubs. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother and may stay with her for close to two years. Wild black bears can live as long as 25 years. They've lived for as long as 30 years or more in captivity. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Much of the black bear's range coincides with the range of its close cousin, the grizzly bear. Although these bears are somewhat similar in appearance and habits, it isn't difficult to tell the difference between them. Colour isn't necessarily a distinguishing characteristic, as both species of bears occur in a range of colours from almost blonde to dark brown or black. Many black bears, however, have a patch of fur on their chests that's lighter in colour than the rest of their fur. Grizzly bears don't have this patch. Size isn't always a distinguishing feature either, although grizzly bears are usually heavier with an average weight of 225 kilos. Black bears average 140 kilos in weight. Grizzly bears spend time digging in the ground for roots and tubers that make up part of their diet. The large muscles they need for this give them a distinct shoulder hump. This hump is absent in black bears, which don't do the same kind of digging. The shape of the face and ears is also different in each species of bear. Grizzly bears have a depression between the eyes and nose, and short round ears. Black bears, on the other hand, have a straighter profile and longer, more pointed ears. Grizzly bears are known for their fearsome, long, sharp claws. Black bears have shorter claws, which are better suited for climbing trees. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a woman talking on the radio about things for children to do during the school holidays. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. The school holidays are fast approaching and I'm sure all of you parents out there are worried about how to occupy your children. Well, I have a few tips that may help keep your children entertained without spending large amounts of money. One of our biggest problems is that today's children often do not have the type of hobby that was familiar in the past, such as making their own toys. Instead, they rely on sophisticated video games to keep them amused. But children also like to feel needed, so why not give them jobs to do around the house? You may be surprised how much they will enjoy simple tasks such as washing your car. Another idea is to use this time to develop their cooking skills. Food is something we all enjoy, so why not get them to prepare some simple dishes in the kitchen? Learning to cook is a useful life skill for children to learn, and it can also keep them happy for several hours. 
Children also love doing arts and crafts, so why not give them the task of making presents for upcoming birthdays or celebrations? Not only will they enjoy making them, but you'll also save some money, and the family or friends who receive the gifts are sure to be delighted. A great idea to get children out of the house is to find out about how they can help in your local community. Perhaps there is a home for the elderly nearby. They are sure to welcome a visit from young people. Even a few minutes a week can brighten their day. Of course, younger children cannot do these things for very long, but older ones may find that there are ongoing projects around your neighbourhood that they can help with. These are just a few ideas, but I'm sure you can think of many more. If not, there are plenty of places to look for other suggestions. Nowadays, the first place people seem to look is the internet, which can be a good source of information. However, it does have its limits because ideas suitable for children living in the city may not translate well for children in rural areas. So, don't overlook your library. These are often filled with great ideas targeted at children in your specific area. There are a few key points to remember, however. One of the most important things is to keep your children active; otherwise, they will be sure to get bored. Also, remember that although children can be very independent, even from nine or ten years old, you should still be there to take care of them up to the age of twelve. So, don't be tempted to let older children babysit their younger siblings. This should only be done by an adult. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.